Hola y bienvenido al resto de historia. Now, how would you like to try a free case of fabulous Portuguese wine? Of course you would, wouldn't they, Tom? And you are in luck because this episode of The Resto e Historia is kindly sponsored by Wine52. And Dominic, their wine odyssey this month takes us to the stunning north of Portugal, which, of course, has very ancient links with us here in England, doesn't it? Uh, if an area was a friend of the rest is history, the north of Portugal would be a friend of the rest is history, Tom. For reasons that we will shortly be explaining, because um, today's podcast is sponsored by Wine52, uh, and because they are promoting Portuguese wine, we thought that we would focus our episode today and the succeeding episodes on the history of Portugal. Yeah, and Wine52 are offering listeners to the rest is history three Portuguese wines for free, unbelievably. So all you need to do is to just go to www.wine52.com slash history. You'll need to cover the postage costs of £8.95, but you will get three free bottles delivered to you. Um, and this is very much the kind of thing that Wine52 do. They showcase the best wine that comes from a different region each and every month. And you have the choice of mixed, red only, white only case. Uh, and also you get a magazine brilliantly called Glug, and you get two tasty snacks as oh, well. Oh, I love a tasty snack. I know you now, do. Now, after your, after your first case, you will join the monthly wine club. But there is no minimum commitment at all. So if it's not for you, you can pause or cancel at any time. Now, remember, it is www.wine52.com slash history. That is, of course, the word wine. Then the numbers 5 and 2.com slash history. And you can claim your case today. So on with the show. Bom dia. The fardo is on. The wine is cracked open. And Dominic, you are full of excitement, are you not? Because today's episode is the first of an epic sweep through the history of Portugal. And you are a huge, is it Lusitanophile? <laughs> Would that be the word? I think a, a, a Lusophile. A Lusophile. Hola, everybody. Bienvindo. Hola, Tom. And uh, that is Lindo Fardo. Lovely Fado music that you're playing in the background it's, there. Very much the atmosphere of a restaurant on the Algarve, <laughs> circa 1975. It's, it's Amalia <laughs> Rodriguez. She's yeah. incredibly famous. Top Fado performer. I'm going to fade her down. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Dominic, this is a subject that you're very, very keen on. I'm going to put my hands up and say that I am less familiar with Portugal than I should be. When I say should be, every patriotic Englishman should go to Portugal because Portugal is, of course, our oldest ally. Um, and that will be a theme running throughout this history, won't it? It will indeed, because uh, the history of Portugal um, is entangled with that of England and later Britain. I think it's the oldest surviving alliance anywhere in the world, Tom. Uh, in some ways, as we'll go on to discuss, um, although it's enshrined in the Treaty of Windsor, its origins go back even further. So it you does. could argue this year is the 650th anniversary of the first alliance between England and Portugal. So it seems appropriate that we're talking about Portugal. But also, Tom, Portugal is one of those countries that can genuinely claim to have changed the world, as we will discuss. We have to say for bad as well as good. Yes, for bad as, as well as good. Darkness as well as light in the story. There is a lot of uh, bloodshed. But it's also the country that in some ways you could argue invented, inaugurated the age, the modern age of globalization. As we'll, yeah. as we'll go on to discuss. And actually, it's a sort of parallel narrative to the narrative that we often tell about the sort of early modern period, because we all, we're all familiar with Columbus and Cortes and Pizarro and the Spanish Armada and Philip II. But this is, the, this is a much less well-known, but, but just as colourful and just as kind of lurid. A story. And in a way, as significant. Yes, absolutely as significant. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But we will, we will come to all that, won't we? Because um, everything must have a beginning. Um, and I thought it would be nice to begin this story, not actually in Portugal, um, but on Capri, which was the subject of uh, our recent episode on Roman holidays with Tiberius, who people who listened to that episode uh, may remember that Tiberius retired there. And there were lurid stories told about his activities. But there was also an alternative narrative in which Tiberius um, pondered the mysteries of uh, of this and other worlds. Um and uh, one of the reports that was brought to him, uh, and we, we get this from a friend of the show, Pliny the Elder, uh, and it says an embassy from Olisipo, which was the, uh, the Roman name for Lisbon, uh, 
Sent for the purpose, reported to the Emperor Tiberius that a triton had been seen and heard playing on a shell in a certain cave. Um, so a triton is a kind of merman. Um, mm. Great wonder. Uh, and I think that the, the, the reason I thought this would be a fun way to start it is that it kind of focuses on a key theme in Portuguese history. And that is, firstly, that waves of invaders tend to come from the Mediterranean. So before the Romans conquered Portugal, you had the Carthaginians, uh, yeah. and subsequently you'll have the Moors, all coming from the south. But there is a sense that because Portugal is facing out to the Atlantic, seen from the perspective of the Mediterranean, it's absolutely on the fringes of the world. Uh, for the Romans, it's it's fronting what they call the, the ocean, this great vast enclosing wave of uh, salt sea. Um, and, and that really sums up the kind of the, the, the paradoxical quality of Portugal, that it's simultaneously a Mediterranean and a and above all, an Atlantic state. Yeah, um, I, think that's, I think that's very, very convincing, Tom. Because if you go to Portugal and you, you sort of stand on the coast, the Atlantic coast, and you look out to sea, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like when you go to sort of the beaches of, of um, the far bit of Cornwall and you kind of look out mm. and there's just the sort of the, the grey seas, huge waves, the wind, the nothingness. The tritons. Yeah, the, the sort of sense of standing on the edge of almost an abyss. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that sense that Portugal is both part of the Mediterranean world, as of course Spain is, or Italy, or France, but it's also on the periphery, and it's kind of you're, you're on, on the edge, I guess. That life on the on the sort of maritime edge, it's really important to Portugal's identity. Yeah, and so the Roman conquest is it really picks up from the Carthaginians, who are um, a Phoenician people for, originally from Lebanon, who who found the great city of Carthage um, in what what's now Tunisia, and they conquer southern Spain. Uh, and it's from that base that Hannibal launches his famous invasion of, of Italy going over the Alps with his elephants. Um, and when Carthage is defeated, Rome annexes those Carthaginian holdings. Very, very important because uh, full of, of mines. And that's really what the Romans are after. Specchia, yeah. gold and silver and so on, which again is a theme that will run throughout this, this history when Portugal itself becomes the colonizer. Um, but really, the history of of Portugal is is bundled in with the history of Spain. It's the, the whole Iberian Peninsula. Um, and it takes the Romans a very long time to conquer the whole of the Iberian Peninsula. And Northern Portugal is is a part of what it takes them a long time to conquer. Um, yeah. So uh, all kinds of famous names are involved in campaigns against people who are called the Lusitanians. So Portugal comes to be known as Lusitania by the Romans. So uh, Marius, great military uh, innovator, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, and then in due course, Augustus, who is the person who completes the conquest. But this idea that northern Portugal is somehow distinct from the south, I think, is important to understanding the, the kind of the geopolitics of, of the region. Um, and you have, it's, it's a, complete, a very, very bloody history. It's marked by all kinds of treachery, by all kinds of massacres. Um, the ancestor of uh, the emperor Galba, uh, is is a particularly bloodstained and treacherous figure in this history, and as with Britain and Boudicca or France and and Vercingetorix, Portugal today remembers um, this figure Viriathus as a, a, a heroic native who tries to to hold off the Romans in vain. Um, but you get you get that you know that sense that you have in in France and and, and Britain as well that, that slightly ambivalent attitude towards the Romans. That you identify very strongly with them, but at the same time you fate the the noble leader who leads a doomed attempt to, to hold them off. Rome um, pacifies Portugal and uh, introduces its distinctive brand of civilization, uh, of which, of course, um, roads is are fundamental because Portugal is not a country that is easy to travel around, is it? I gather you'd know better than me. Well, I mean, you you were saying about the, the the geography of it, so. I suppose you could say in a very sort of simplistic way, there are three sort of zones. There is the north, which is very green, and the, the valleys that you, I mean, that's where a lot of the wine comes from. So the the, the valley of the Douro going from, from Porto. So it's actually quite sort of verdant and it can be quite wet. And then you've got the center and you've got this sort of the Alentejo with these cork forests. And that is really baking in summer. If you ever go in summer, it's absolutely scorching. And in the south, you have the Algarve, 
Yeah. And the Algarve Dominic is where I um, fried my buttocks. Oh, that a lovely image that is. How did that happen, Tom? Um, I, I kind of lay on a beach and uh, failed to um, adequately pull down my swimming trunks. So by the end of the End of the end of the day, they were dripping blood. They had burnt so badly. What what an extraordinary image that is. Well, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. That's why I never I never went back to Portugal. Wow. So you went to the Algarve, which I've never been to the Algarve, but in my mind, it's an enormous golf course. Is that um, is that fair? I'm sure it is. I just went. I just nipped over from Spain and went to the beach. And went to the um, beach and, and yeah, disgraced yourself. Absolutely. And disgraced my <laughs> disgraced myself exactly. Oh. But the mention of Algarve reminds us of of further waves of conquerors. So Rome collapses. Roman Empire collapses in the west. Gets taken over by the Visigoths, um, who were very very militantly Christian. Uh, and they really helped Christianity to bed down in Portugal. Um, mm-hmm. But then uh, the next wave of uh, of invaders, uh, as the Carthaginians had done, as the Romans had done, come from the south. And that, of course, is the, the Muslims, the Arabs, the Moors, Mauritanians, whatever you want to call them. So it's the Umayyads, the Umayyad dynasty, isn't it, Tom? Is that right? Well, not initially. And then the Umayyads come. And we're going to be talking about this in a subsequent episode. But um, the, the reason that I mentioned Algarve is that Algarve is Algarve originally in Arabic. So it's the West the western portion of Al-Andalus, uh, the, the Atlantic realm. Um, and the, uh, the the Moors, as the Carthaginians had done, are, are unable to conquer the north. So the north holds out under Christian kings, which is exactly the same thing, of course, that's happening in Spain at the same time. But at this point, you know, you're talking about Portugal and Spain. Um, it's really important, I, I think, to say, isn't it, that um, there's no sense of there being two countries called no. Portugal and Spain. They're just a series of former provinces of the Roman Empire that were, that were ended up under the Visigoths and then, by and large, end up under the Moors. I mean, the Moors, are, yeah. even if they don't take over the whole peninsula, they're yeah. by far the biggest power in the peninsula, aren't they? Yeah, so that's the division. It's between the, 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 the predominant Moorish Muslim powers in the south that have all the kind of the rich lands and the Christians have been confined to the, the mountainous um, reaches of the yeah. north, but that enables them to kind of preserve a, a kind of shaky independence. Um, and Lisbon becomes a, a, a great city under Muslim patronage. So we have um, a, a, a geographer called Idrisi who praises it for its baths and its sanitation, which is obviously an inheritance from, from the Romans. Um, but as we say, the Christians hold out and by the end of the 11th century, which is a period when um, Latin Christendom is on the move on almost every front. So mm-hmm. you're, it, it, it's the age of the Crusades. It's the age where the Re- Reconquista is starting to really get going in uh, in Spain. And the same process happens in what will become Portugal. And in fact, it's this process that gives Portugal its name because you have um, a nobleman from Burgundy who's called Henri, Henry, um, and he has kind of established a kind of duchy, a, 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 a county um, on the Douro, the River Douro, around um, a Porto, with kind of a great harbour yeah. in the north. Um, and this land becomes known as the land of the port, Portugal. Because it's Portus Calais, isn't it? Yeah. That's the original. Yeah. Um, and at that point, Tom, I think I'm right in saying it's a, it's a, it's a vassal of the kingdom of Leon, which we would think of as one of the cradles of kind of Spanishness. So at this point, the idea of there being Portugueseness and, and Spanishness makes no sense at all. There are, there's a sort of patchwork, isn't there, in the Iberian Peninsula of medieval kingdoms, a sort of endlessly shifting yeah. alliances. And actually, you know the image that people have of the Reconquista, which is um, sort of heroic Spanish knights driving back the Moors. It's actually a bit more complicated, isn't it? Because they're always sort of falling out with themselves, each other, and yeah, they're all fighting each other as well. And exactly, and sort of playing off the Moors against one another, and the Moors are playing them off against each other, and it's much yeah. more complicated. Yeah, well, so the Moors are fragmented into kingdoms as well. So it's it's all a bit quite complicated. And one of the one of the things that um, Christian noblemen are obviously keen to do if they get the chance is to um, claim the cr- a crown. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah so Henri um a bit like uh, I suppose William the Conqueror at the same time I mean he's a, he's a French nobleman who ha- has has traveled abroad looking for promotion um and his son um Alfonso Henriquez yeah um, he does that he he announces that he's a king um and effectively this is what makes promotes Portugal from an earldom to a kingdom yeah. So he's regarded by a lot of Portuguese as one of the absolute greatest 
um, people in Portuguese history. So we'll probably come back to this later on, particularly when we get to the 20th century. Do you remember there was that TV series, Great Britons, Tom? Yes. Which Churchill won, beating his embarred kingdom, Brunel, in the final. And um, Princess Diana. So hundreds of thousands of people voted. Well, lots of people copied this, and the Portuguese had one. And Afonso I was one of the top contenders, I think. I mean, we'll come later to the person who, who beat him. But he's born in about the beginning of the 12th century, and he fights three battles. So he beats his own mother in one of them, very medieval see, behavior. That, that is very, very medieval behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Battle of Saint Mehmed in 1128, and then there's the Battle of Ulrich in 1139. And St. James helps him in that battle, apparently. Which is yeah, well, St. James is always thing. turning up. So that's Santiago. Yeah. As in the, as in the Great Pilgrimage. Right. So we think of him as a kind of Galician, northern Spanish saint, but that, I suppose, gives you a, a sense of how the sort of boundaries and the geography are much more ambiguous than they are now. And then the final one is taking Lisbon in 1147. So he's called himself a king already, hasn't he, he has, Afonso? Yes. But he basically needs one more victory to get the papacy to sort of, you know, give him the stamp of approval and say, yes, you are a king. And so 1147, the siege of Lisbon, this is where the English make their first appearance splendid. in the Portuguese story. So it's a splendid moment. Um, and this is part of the Second Crusade. So uh, the Second Crusade generally is a, is a bit of a disaster. Uh, nothing really goes right. But, so unlike uh, all the other Crusades. <laughs> well, the First Crusade, I mean, if you're a crusader, goes tremendously well. They capture Jerusalem and, you know, establish their kingdom. Um, but the Second Crusade is, is um, from the point of view of Crusades, is, is not a success. However, the Siege of Lisbon is, is a great success. Um, and it consists of of a large number of people from the northern Christian kingdoms, of whom the majority are English, but there are Germans as well. There are uh, people from uh, Flanders uh, and so on. And they sail from Dartmouth and they land in Portugal. And yeah, so you're sailing. Um, and Alfonso says, why don't you help me take Lisbon? And they think this is a great idea. Um, and they lay siege to Lisbon and Lisbon ends up surrendering. Tom, did you notice some of their names? So there's, their leader is called uh, Hervey de Glanville. So he's called Harvey, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, Simon of Dover, Andrew of London, Keith of Banbury. And Gilbert of Hastings. <laughs> Some of those I've made up. But they're, they're a sort of strange selection of people, and we know nothing about them at all, do we? Well, we do. We know that they behave very, very well in comparison, oh, yeah. I'm afraid to say, to the Germans and the Flemish. The Germans. Oh, this is a, this is a preview of behavior <laughs> on Algarve beaches, Tom. <laughs> well, but the, <laughs> but the Flemish as well. So basically the Belgians are, are misbehaving too. So the, um, the Muslims agree to, to surrender Lisbon and terms are agreed. Um, and the Flemish and the Germans ignore them. They go on the rampage. However, the English, their faith was of the utmost importance to them and contemplating where such behavior might lead, they remained quietly in their assigned position, preferring not to go on the rampage and wishing not to violate the obligations to God. And I think that that is commendable. That reflects very well on us. And you know what the same guy says, the same chronicler says of the Germans? They ran hither and yon. They plundered, they broke down doors, they rummaged through the inside of every house, they destroyed clothes and utensils, they treated virgins shamefully, they acted as if right and wrong were the same. They put their towels down half an hour before everyone oh, else. Yes. Yeah, so shocking behaviour. And because of this, uh, understandably, impressed by the, the, the godly and saintly behaviour of the English, the first Bishop of Lisbon is Gilbert of Hastings. Oh. Um, and he's the younger son of the steward of uh, Bury St. Edmunds, which is brilliant. So that's good anyway. news for Bury St. Edmunds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so that's all great stuff. Um, and it's um, it's the theme of um, a novel by uh, Jose Saramago. Have you read that? The uh, the history of the siege of Lisbon. No, it's very good, and it all depends on. Um, so it's a you know typical subtle clever novel working on multiple yeah. levels and it's about an editor who is assigned a book on the siege of lisbon and he decides just for fun to alter um the meaning of a crucial sentence by inserting the word not oh, in the right. text so that the book now claims that the crusaders did not come to the aid of the portuguese king in taking lisbon from the moors and so everything gets upended which you know what there's a the portuguese themselves tell a story about the siege of lisbon that completely contradicts the sort of historical narrative so one of their great heroes is a man called Martin Moniz, and he's supposed to have um, 
in the siege of the castle, the Moors were trying to shut a door, and he basically stuck his body in the doorway so that um, they were they were to you know, block the doorway so that his comrades could get in past his body while the Moors were hacking at him, and he sacrificed himself. But unfortunately, the Moors actually surrendered the castle uh, in a deal with the Christians, so this almost certainly didn't happen. But he's got a metro station named after him. Which is nice. <laughs> well, there you get. So who's laughing last? Well, yeah, it's true. I mean, the rest <laughs> yeah. of history obviously specialises yeah. in things that didn't really happen. But um, <laughs> well, by those yeah. our own standards. But Martin Monez won. <laughs> Historians nil, I think. Yeah, so that's right fair to say. But Tom, that sort of theme of the English that sort of runs right through Portuguese history, doesn't it? So should we should we jump to the 14th century? It's when the English reappear in the story. You mentioned the um, the treaty that Edward III and Ferdinand of Portugal sign in 1372. So this is the anniversary of it, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. But there was actually one before that in 1353, and it was a commercial treaty, which was signed um, not kind of king and king, but commercial port and commercial port. And the two commercial ports were London and Oporto. And so that trading relationship between London and Oporto, which in due course will give its name to port wine, is very, very early. So we're giving them cloth and they're giving us wine, wine, basically. oil, yeah. olive oil, yeah. salt, yeah. Uh, cork, things that we can't get, basically. And I suppose it's also England and Portugal are natural allies. I mean, they're both Atlantic countries, outward facing, but they also... And they're both peripheral. Yeah, they're peripheral and they're sort of... They're, and there are big powers in between them. Yeah. So, I don't know, the Kingdom of Leon or the Kingdom of France is the yeah. obvious one, I suppose. Yeah. So it sort of makes sense. And it's an extraordinary thing that that, that alliance has lasted basically the best part of seven centuries. Extraordinary. And I think reflects tremendously well on both sides. On the Portuguese, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and so, our, um, our, you know, our steadfast um, keeping our word. Um, of course. But it's, it's sealed, isn't it, by the, the Treaty of Windsor in 1386, um, when we very generously donate a princess. So that's John uh, of Gaunt's daughter, yeah. isn't it? Philippa of Lancaster. Yeah, who was a tremendously um, impressive woman. So she, she was taught by Chaucer, the great poet, by Froissart, the great French chronicler, historian of the Hundred Years' War, uh, and by John Wycliffe, amazingly. A, ba a Balliol man, Tom. A Balliol man, the proto-Protestant. So um, yeah. basically she, I mean, you know, she, she was taught by the leading intellectual figures of the age. Yes, top, top teachers. Just. Top people. But she's quite old. By bride standards. So she's 27. And a lot of Portuguese people apparently at the time said, this is a terrible move. She's much too old to, to have ch <laughs> children. But do you, know, do you know about the actual marriage? I don't. I'd like to hear about it. Because the, the marriage happened without the presence of, um, of the groom, John, of, John I of Portugal. Because he was in Portugal and Philippa was in England. So yep. they had a stand-in. Um, and then apparently it was um, a Portuguese custom when this happened that the stand-in would pretend to bed her. So oh. that's a, a striking scene. <laughs> do they have sort of, in, what are they called? Intimacy coordinators or whatever. <laughs> yes, I, I don't know. I don't know how that operated. But apparently this was a very distinctive Portuguese custom that right. I, I imagine has since gone into abeyance. But I was about to ask you if you had to employ a stand-in at your own wedding. <laughs> but now that I've heard that, that twist, I won't ask you because it's a very incriminating question. Well, I'm not Portuguese, so that's not the kind of... So it's not going to come up. The no. kind of thing that we got up to. Um, anyway, so, so Philippa goes off to um, to Portugal and she marries John, Jao, yeah. uh, the first of Portugal. Um, and it's all a tremendous success. He already has a mistress who's very beautiful and Philippa is rather plain, but he ends up absolutely adoring her and she gives him nine children, I think. And they're known as the illustrious generation. And I think, Dominic, we should take a break here. Okay. Uh, and when we come back, we should explain how and why they are called the illustrious generation. Well, because one of those, one of those children is arguably going to change the world, isn't he, Tom? I mean, that's yeah. not, too, not too great an exaggeration. No, I think so, that's not too great an exaggeration. After the break, find out who he was and what he did. Before we get back to today's episode, thanks to our sponsors, Wine52, for those lovely Portuguese wines we were talking about at the start of the show. Um, Dominic, I can see that during the interval, in best yeah. professional style, you have cracked open a bottle of Portuguese wine. I'm on my third bottle, actually, Tom. I was drinking a lot while you were talking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do my eyes deceive me, or is that the Atua by Quintas do Omem? 
by any chance and if it is how is it beautiful it's so it's um it's lovely actually it's it's a white wine well it's i say white wine it's what the portuguese call a vino verde which is um a kind of green wine and it's made from a blend of uh, local grape varieties so it's a sort of um it's very maritime wine well, that's suitable, isn't it, for Portugal? Exactly. Henry the Navigator would love it. Um, so it's very melony and limey and kind of grassy and citrusy. Um, it's very light. You should have it with, I don't know, oysters or something or mussels. And it's definitely a sort of higher end offering, Tom, I would say, from, from one of Portugal's best loved regions. Excellent. Well, um, I've actually just opened a bottle too, and I will give you um, my verdict on it at the end of today's episode. And just for listeners, Tom is actually drinking directly from the bottle, which I definitely don't recommend. <laughs> I would pour it out first. Now, if you want to claim your free case of Portuguese wine, all you need to do is go to www.wine52.com slash history. That's wine52.com slash history and cover the postage costs of £8.95 and you will get three free bottles delivered to you. Right, back to the show. So welcome back to The Rest is History, everybody. Um, Tom, you were telling us before the break with great gusto about Philippa of Lancaster, um, who you're clearly a very big fan of. So she's gone off to Portugal. Um, I think she arrives in, what, 1387, is it, or something like that? We have signed our alliance with the Portuguese, which is obviously splendid news for everybody. We're selling them uh, fish and cloth, and they're now selling us wine and cork and salt and oil. And there are these English warehouses in Porto, which are the sort of ancestors of the port wine, great port wine houses that you see today on the, on the banks of the Douro. And, well, Philippa is a tremendous success, as you were saying. She dies in the summer of 1415, Tom. And um, it is said that as she lies there dying, there's a wind that kind of blows through the house. And she says, what's the wind? And somebody says, it is the north wind, your majesty, or whatever. And she says, that will be a great wind for my husband and son's voyage to Africa. And then she dies. And then she dies. So what's going on? Well, so 1415, of course, is better known in England for the Battle of Agincourt, where Philippa's nephew, Henry V, defeats the French. Um, and her sons are, are very kind of Henry V characters. They are great warriors uh, and they are terrifyingly devout. And they kind of fuse it um, into this kind of distinctive sense of conviction, purpose, and aggression, not to put too fine yeah. a word on it. Um, and you get, I guess there are kind of three who stand out. So you have Duarte, Edward, uh, who, who becomes the king, a great warrior. You have Pedro, Peter, who, who is a fabulously well-traveled man. I mean, he goes all over the place. And then you have Enrique, Henry, who will come to be known in the English-speaking world as Henry the Navigator. And but all three of them are very, very impressive figures. And this wind that Philippa, <laughs> as she lies dying, hears blowing is, yeah. is a wind that is blowing the Portuguese fleet across the straits from Portugal to to North Africa and specifically to the great fort of Ceuta. Beautiful pronunciation, Tom. Um, Thank you. Some people may know Ceuta now because it's um basically on the Moroccan coast, but it's actually Spanish. It's an enclave. There was this sort of incredibly fortified uh, sort of Moorish stronghold, one of the great kind of trading citadels of the North African coast. Yeah, so it's Ceuta and Tangier, the two great fortresses that are, that, that are on the North African coast opposite Portugal. This is Portugal's sort of entrance onto the world stage in a way, isn't it? Because up to this point, it's been one of multiple kind of small you know, slightly sort of fly-bitten Iberian kingdom, Christian kingdoms. It's still very poor. It's basically they're all farmers and fishermen. Um, there's only a million people. And they go across the, the sea and uh, they they basically smash their way into the city. Well, they take them, yeah, they take them completely by surprise. I think they only lose eight men or something. It's a kind of storming victory. But um, but then they, they, they capture it and they realize that basically it's all been a waste of effort because all the trade that was going to Ceuta is now going to Tangier. And essentially it's costing them an absolute fortune and they're making absolutely nothing from it. And then finally the Portuguese do capture um, Tangier in 1471. So it, it's taken them a long time, but they do get both those 
great fortresses. Um, and that's kind of a signal, really, that, as you say, Portugal it has arrived as a kind of great power. So in due course, um, let's call him Henry, because we know him as Henry the Navigator in English. So he's, he's behaved very well in the, in the capture. He's won his spurs there. So he's 21, um, he's 21 in 1415, I think. Yeah. So wins his spurs, great hero. And in 1437, he tries to capture Tangier. And that goes disastrously wrong. And um, he's defeated. He negotiates um, a safe passage for his, himself and his army back to Ceuta. Um, and the moment he gets back to Ceuta, he reneges on the deal. Um, so I'm afraid that that's, that doesn't redound very well to him. That's kind of Germano Flemish behavior <laughs> rather than, rather than he's English. Still, so he's to, to sort of paint a bit of a picture of him. He is, an, I mean, you would love him, Tom. He is. Why? Because he thinks everything is very deeply Christian, like you. He, uh, <laughs> he, yeah, but he likes, he, he likes ships. I'm less keen on ships. He, um, yeah, you're not keen on rope, I think, specifically. That's <laughs> yeah, your, I'm not keen on rope. That's your um, objection to the novels of Patrick O'Brien, who surely would admire uh, Peter, Henry the Navigator. Anyway, he, he's very, very, he's celibate. He never marries. He wears a hair shirt. You know, he's a very sort of strict... He's actually, you know, your comparison with Henry V. Exactly. It's it's that kind of militant asceticism. Yeah. Um, makes him, a, a, I think, a very frightening figure. So, yeah, so so he's an, he's militantly ascetic. So he's he's a very austere figure, Tom, but he's also visionary, isn't he? Because when they talk Suter in 1415, I mean, that's... Portugal has been on the periphery, and now they've they've sort of got a toehold in North Africa. And there's this sort of sense that beyond there is all this stuff going on that they don't really know about. There are caravans crossing the Sahara and there are spices and there are ships coming from across the Islamic world. And there's this sort of, it's like they, they've, they've got a glimpse into this vast trading network that they previously, you know, were slightly in the dark about. And there's, I don't know, cinnamon and cloves and all kinds of stuff that's very exciting for them. And I guess Henry, I would say Henry the Navigator's sort of his vision, he thinks that despite Portugal's poverty and its kind of peripheral nature, that they can get a piece of this. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's a, a blend, again, very Henry V of greed, you know, a, a lust for wealth, for land, for all the good things that that brings, um, but also a kind of almost mystical sense of Christian militancy. Um, because Henry the Navigator is also very, very interested in destroying Islam. I mean, that's the scale on which he's thinking. He wants to destroy Islam and he wants to outflank the Muslim world. And he wants to discover um, this mysterious great Christian king who supposedly lurks beyond the limits of, of, of the world that the Portuguese know called Prester John, yeah. who is a kind of complete, it turns out to be a completely mythical figure. Uh, a kind of compound of all kinds of rumours that over the course of the Medi Middle Ages have have mixed together. Um, and he never actually exists, but he serves the, the figure of Prester John, the idea that this great king exists tantalisingly just over the horizon, and that if only the Portuguese can establish contact with him, then they can forge an alliance and destroy Islam. I think that's also a kind, you know, as well as the, the kind of the lust for spices and silks and jewels and so on, I think that that is also a, a, a key determinant. And in a way there, it's, it's hard to disentangle them because they, they're kind of fused together. Let's sort of unpack some of this, Tom. So first of all, the, the Prester John stuff. So this idea that there's basically this Christian monarch out there in, in, in Africa somewhere or beyond the, the Islamic world. I mean, there's sort of a grain of truth, isn't that? Because there is a Christian kingdom in Ethiopia. Yeah. They're, they know that there are Nestorian Christians somewhere in, in Asia. In Asia, yeah. Um, so the sort of garbled rumors of this have reached the sort of Western Christendom. And I suppose this fuses with your thing about anti-Islam because, of course, the Islamic world is on the march. The Constantinople is going to fall in 1453. The Turks are kind of carrying all before them in the Balkans. Um, they're expanding and expanding and going to reach their peak. I mean, they're not even going to reach their peak for another 100 years or so. So it, you can sort of see how there's this kind of, this ideological, this sort of almost apocalyptic sense. We yeah. absolutely have to launch a fight back. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that the way that the kind of the militant Christianity and the greed fuse is the fact that obviously the Muslim world controls 
the trade links to the east. So you know, they control Egypt, they control the Red Sea, uh, they control uh, Mesopotamia and Iran. Um, so it's very, very difficult for Europeans to get all these sources, except through Muslim middlemen. And so the dream of either destroying Islam or outflanking it, yeah, you, know, you, could, you could say, well, this is my Christian duty and it will enable me to get very rich. You know, that's everyone's a winner there. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking at what, um, I mean, based, the Pope gives them, a, he gives Henry the Navigator a kind of a remit and he says, you can invade, search out, capture, vanquish and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever and other enemies of Christ and reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. So from the sort of beginning, there is a, an enormously sort of aggressive side to this. But it doesn't, I guess, you. I mean, if you're telling the story of the Portuguese expansion, it'd be wrong to, I mean, we will get into some, some pretty gruesome scenes, but there's also amazing technological innovation. So Henry basically has this place, um, some of you may be familiar with a beer called Sagresh. And at, at Sagresh, which is on the south of very southern sort of tip of Portugal, he gets all these cartographers and navigators and astronomers, um, Christians and Jews, and they're reading sort of Arab texts and sharing ideas. And they help to devise this new ship called a caravel. Um, are you familiar? Are you, of course, you don't like ship design, Tom. I know that it has flat bottom, doesn't it? It has it has a very shallow, but I don't actually understand ship design either. I'm just, repeat, <laughs> I'm, just I'm just reading stuff that I've that I've repeated it's stuff that I've read. It's a flat bottom ship, and it has crucially triangular sails. Um, <laughs> so, Dominic, so, explain to me why that matters. Well, Tom, with a square <laughs> sail, with a square <laughs> sail, you um, it's it's very hard. You can actually only direct. You can only effectively sail with a direct wind from a stern. Did you know that? Of course, everyone knows that. Okay, so you can only effectively sail with a direct wind from a stern. With a triangular sail, the world is your oyster. You can just crack on and with your you ropes a, and your knots. Yeah, with, yeah absolutely. That, now this is top. This is absolutely first class maritime technological analysis. So anyway, they've got these brilliant <laughs> ships with these triangular sails called caravels, and actually, you know, Portugal is well placed clearly to sort of get out into the world and explore things so could i just one thing on the the ship <laughs> the caravel te- the ship yeah, technology. you wanted to hear more about the sails no i want to uh, talk about the bottoms so oh, the reason right. why the, the flat bottom matters yeah is because um nobody in portugal knows how far africa stretches southwards but they hope that perhaps uh, there will be a river that leads from the west coast of africa uh inland and will meet up with the Nile, thereby enabling ships basically to, to burst out into the, uh, into the Mediterranean or perhaps out into the uh, Indian Ocean. Um, and so this dream that there are rivers that will cut across the whole of Africa, that's something that um, Henry the Navigator is very, very into. And obviously you need a very flat bottom ship to negotiate rivers. So that's my contribution. So, Tom, you've been hiding this this maritime <laughs> technological light under a bushel. You know much more about well, ship design than you were letting on. Well, um, yeah. Anyway, they will actually end up going up the Congo, going part of the way up the Congo. A fellow called Diego Cao, I think his name is. The Senegal, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all kinds of rivers. So, <laughs> all kinds of rivers. So, they end up, They some of them get washed up in Madeira. So, they take Madeira in 1419. So, that's out in the Atlantic. Then the Azores. They take. They first colonized the Azores in 1539, and on Madeira, Dominic, don't they? They develop sugarcane. They do. So actually, you know the story that we tell in the West, or indeed in the world generally, about the conquest of the Americas, about globalization, about European expansion, which begins in 1492 with Columbus. That story is actually kind of wrong because the Portuguese. I mean, Columbus had been t- sort of you know, selling himself around the, the Iberian courts to try and get sponsorship for his voyage for years before he ends up going in 1492. And one reason the Portuguese don't give him the contract is because they're well ahead of the game. They've already started doing it. So they've got Madeira and they've started, Henry the Navigator actually has the idea, he says, we could grow sugarcane here. Why don't we have kind of plantations? So you have the ancestor of what you're going to get in Brazil and elsewhere. They've got the Azores, but as you said, I mean, most amazingly, uh, at a time when England is, you know, Jack Cade's Rebellion and the Wars of the Roses, 
the Portuguese are sailing down the coast of West Africa in these caravels, and they are charting all the capes. And as you said, they're they're sort of inching up the Senegal River, and they're grabbing islands also, aren't they? So they they grab the Cape Verde Islands, they they grab Sao Tome, exactly. And the first, so 1444, I mean, this is, you're talking about the dark side. 1444, they raid an island called Arguin Island, which is off the coast of Mauritania. And that's the first year that they basically take men, African men, women, and children, and they bring them back to sell them in the slave markets in Lisbon. And this is against a context. I mean, first of all, there is slavery in Portugal and what becomes Spain in this period generally. There are lots of slaves, but obviously the Mediterranean is a colossal slave trading marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. It's a slave trading lake. So this is not, I mean, at the time it doesn't seem like a huge deal, a new innovation, but, and, and they start doing it more and more. So I think there are tens of thousands of Africans are brought back to Lisbon. Well, 20,000, 20,000 apparently over the next 15 years. So yeah. Yeah. And at the time, again, I I mean, that sounds like an enormous number, but this is in a a world in which tens of thousands of slaves are being shipped, you know, here, there and everywhere all the time. So people don't actually remark on it at the time and say, gosh, this is a... It's still quite a novelty uh, because apparently in the 1450s, the profit on a a slave from Mauritania, so Morocco, uh, it it was estimated to be at 700%. So that suggests Crikey. that it's still quite, yeah. you know. I suppose the novelty a, of the of, yeah. of a black slave, I guess, in the the slave markets of of Lisbon. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of it's a, this is a sort of chilling harbinger, I suppose. Yes, and of course, the, and, of and they're not only being brought back to the Portuguese homeland; they're also being taken to these infant plantations. Yeah, that are are being founded on in the in in Madeira and the Azores. So, yeah. So that's absolutely the kind of the dark side of this dream of discovering the world that Henry is pushing. Um, and I wonder, Dominic, should we should we leave it there with Portugal poised to go even further? Because um, I think it's clear by the time that Henry dies that it, yeah, fourteen sixty he dies that these rivers in at, that that they're finding on the west coast of Africa are not actually going to lead to the. Uh, to either to Egypt or to the Indian Ocean, and that therefore there is no choice if uh, the Portuguese are, are going to get to the Indian Ocean and the riches that lie beyond. Um, they're going to have to go all the way down the coast of Africa and bypass the continent, and, and they don't even know if that's possible. They no. don't, but, and it, you know, and what happens is an incredible. I mean, such a colourful story, very blood soaked, very dramatic. Just before we finish today's episode, now, Tom. Uh, while I've been talking, I can't help but notice that you have been quaffing away at yet another Portuguese wine. And I think I'm right in saying that is the Cheiro Tinto from Lavradores de Feitoria, isn't it? Uh, trips off the tongue. Uh, what's the verdict? Is it good? Is it is it nice? <laughs> well, it's so it's um, uh, red. I, I believe that the wine critics would describe it as vibrant and um, medium bodied. And it is bursting with all the fruit flavours that one would associate with Portugal. So ripe, dark plums, cherry aromas. Um, so very fresh, very, um, dare I say, fruity on the palate. Um, so, uh, yeah, lovely. It's, uh, I, I, I guess if I was to say it was silky as well, the kind of silks that Vasco da Gama would have brought back from, from India. So, yeah, uh, yeah d- delicious and very Portuguese. Excellent. So, listen, thank you so much. Obrigado to Wine52 for sponsoring today's episode. Now, remember that you too can join in our Portuguese Wine Odyssey, or rather go on your own Portuguese Wine Odyssey. If you go to www.wine52.com slash history, you will need to cover their postage costs of £8.95. But on the other hand, you will get three free bottles. You will get Glug magazine and you will get... Love Glug. (laughs) You love Glug. And we love Glug magazine. It's actually one of my favourite magazines. You'll get Glug magazine and you will get, Tom, crucially, two tasty snacks delivered right to your door. And I think, Dominic, you've already established you love a snack. I, <laughs> well, you, you, love a, you love a wine. I love a snack. Everybody's happy. <laughs> we all so, love Glug. <laughs> yeah, and we both love Glug. So listen, we will be back uh, next time for part two of this epic History of Portugal series. And we will see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.